Welcome to MPNUniversity.tv Clinical Insights. This discussion is about the standard of care in treating polycythemia vera and is moderated by Dr. Ruben Mesa. Our panel discussants are Dr. Serge Verstavsik, Dr. Richard Silver, and Emily Knight. Hello. Our focus now is going to shift on the standard care of patients with polycythemia vera. And specifically, we're going to be focusing on the role of cytoreductive therapies and how they help to control accounts and have other benefits for patients with polycythemia vera. As we've discussed, aspirin plays a role in trying to prevent thrombosis in patients with P. vera, as does the control of the hematocrit. Now, for many, hydroxyurea is the physician's first choice of therapy for PV. At the moment, we have no universal guidelines regarding the management of PV, so hence our discussion today. Dr. Silver, perhaps you could share with us from the PVERA study group, which was, I think, the, the definitive work regarding hydroxyurea and PVERA. What did we learn, and how did hydroxyurea become the initial standard of care in PVERA? Well, that's an excellent question, uh, Ruben, because it goes back to the history of the treatment of the disease. And <clears throat> the polycythemia vera study group, as you uh, recall, was the first cooperative chemotherapy group in the United States that randomized patients to three distinct arms because there was a great argument then, as there is 75 years later, as to the best treatment of polycythemia vera. The first arm was phlebotomy only, and those patients uh, were found to have a very high frequency of thrombotic disease. And in fact, in the first five years of the study, uh, there was a significant, about 30% to 40% of the patients on the, th on, the th on the phlebotomy arm had a significant thrombosis. The second arm was chloramucil. And in the fifth year, that was found to cause a high frequency of acute leukemia. So it was known and everyone agreed that alkylating agents should not be used in high dose in treating any myeloproliferative disease. And the third arm was radioactive phosphorus, which was a choice of people from the, uh, some of our European colleagues, particularly France, and some of our colleagues in the United States who, after the uh, Second World War, had access to a lot of radioisotopes. In fact, radioactive phosphorus is still a very good treatment modality, but it also caused an increased incidence of acute leukemia compared to phlebotomy <coughs> alone. And it was for that reason that the polycythemia virus study group looked for a different agent, and they selected hydroxyurea because that was a commonly used uh, anti-metabolite. It is not an alkylating agent, but it is a nonspecific cell poison. And in my opinion, uh, it is not terribly effective because in the PVSG data, only 25 to 35 percent of patients really had a significant beneficial response. And in patients who had previously been treated, nearly 40 percent had to terminate by the end of the first year because of toxicity. Now, nevertheless, hydroxyurea is a uh, easily administered oral agent but does have toxicity, and, but other drugs that therefore, because hydroxyurea was not a cure-all, have been, uh, uh, other drugs have been examined for their efficacy in polycythemia vera. Well, great. Well, very, very helpful perspective. Now, Serge, in terms of your patients, regarding the decision for cytoreduction, when you choose cytoreduction, and perhaps as frontline, We'll just put it out there, hydroxyurea and interferon are currently being tested as possible frontline options. Who do you choose to uh, use cytoreduction, and when you choose to use that, what are your goals of treatment? The textbooks would always tell you that there are two main factors that uh, you should apply in your everyday practice to determine who is at a high risk for thrombosis because the therapies are aimed not to eliminate disease, unfortunately. We don't have a cure. We have therapies that can decrease the risk of thrombosis and the age over 60 or history of a blood clot are usually two determining factors that lead us to implement cytoreductive therapy. Now, we also need to recognize that patients that are younger or did not have a, a blood clot in the past 
may need a cytoreductive therapy in specific circumstances. If, for example, they suffer from uncontrolled symptoms related to the disease, they require very frequent phlebotomies and they do not subside over time, as usually you would expect because of developing iron deficiency, or the access to a veins becomes a problematic for the patients. These are some of the examples where you would intervene even sooner or the patient has other medical reasons for high coagulability state, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, smoking, and others. So it's not, again, black and white picture. We have a guidelines. I consider those guidelines, 60 years of age and history of DVT, but certainly there are situations, medical situations where you can intervene sooner. We are preoccupied by the thrombotic risk, but we are not really measuring that thrombotic risk very well other than looking at the blood cell count. And the goals of the therapy with hydroxyurea or phlebotomy are to decrease the red blood cell count. Interestingly, the platelet number is not a risk factor for thrombosis, but we are also a little bit worried about too many platelets there. I would like to see in the near future more comprehensive, at least at the diagnosis, a panel of tests that we would implement to give us not just perspective on the red blood cell count as a guideline, but hypercoagulability state of a patient in a given time as it's related to red blood cells, as it's related to the platelets, to guide us what to do, what kind of antiplatelet agent to use, is it there a role for something beyond just baby aspirin, and when to really engage in the cytoreductive therapy. Very helpful. Now, as patients are on cytoreduction, uh, you know, as a nurse interacting literally with hundreds of patients who are on hydroxyurea in, for polycythemia vera or interferon alpha, what are some of the things that you're listening for as you're both looking at patients' blood counts but also hearing from them possible side effects they're having? Um, so side effects is, is very important as we get the, the blood counts in, um, we follow up with the patients and, and assess their symptoms and if, if they're having uncontrolled um, pruritus or, or other symptoms, we would notify you know you and along with those lab those lab tests and maybe make adjustments to their dose. Um, when talking with the patients, it's important for for nursing to um, verify their dose because with the hydrea, um, they can be on alternating doses of medications. They might take two tablets one day, one tablet the next. So education um, and then symptom assessment is is key. Very good. Very good. Uh, if I may I add, I think there is a real need for team approach here. You see, in everyday community practice, we are privileged, we are in an academic institution, we are focused on what we do, myeloperiphery neoplasms. But in everyday practice, patients with PV are considered easy patients comparing to patients who have lung cancer or colon cancer. And many times it is uh, more on uh, some kind of autopilot therapy approach <coughs> where the nursing and physician assistant participate. And this is where the team effort needs to be in place to assess the symptoms. It's not just the numbers. The symptoms, the side effects of therapy. I have seen referrals of the patients that have mouth ulcers or the skin ulcers. Nobody recognized this as a side effect of hydria. Nobody institute therapy in patients who is low risk but have terrible itching, anxiety, peripheral neuropathy from the disease in a need of therapy. I think the emphasis on education broadly, not just the physician education, is, in, is needed for PV to be optimally managed. So I, I think you're exactly correct, Serge. I think that, that frequently these patients suffer a bit by comparison. You know, if the patient that was seen preceding is somebody with advanced pancreatic cancer, it's a very different disease. And true, they are better off than the patients with, with pancreas cancer, but still they have many severe unmet needs. You know, those toxicities that we can see with hydroxyurea, you know, are not always present, but if they're present, they, they can be severe. The, the ulcerations in the leg or the mouth, you know, practicing here in Phoenix, I'm quite mindful of the risk of skin cancer and secondary malignancies. Uh, patients getting a lot of sun, you know, whether here or in other areas with that agent that has a fairly clear tie to, to malignancies like that is a, is a key risk. Now, one area that is very controversial, uh, and maybe Dick can get your perspective, is does hydroxyurea uh, lead to acute leukemia in these patients, or is it a contributor in patients who end up progressing to acute leukemia? Well, that's a very important uh, point, Ruben. The, um, 
This really goes, again, goes back to the polycythemia vera uh, days when they did a study with hydroxyurea alone and found a frequency of secondary acute leukemia of about 9%. It wasn't statistically different than a historic control, but it was not, it was not a randomized study by any matter of means. It's very important, and we have discussed this many times, to recognize that the secondary acute leukemia that has given rise to all of this discussion about hydroxyurea is time and dose dependent. And the uh, European Cooperative uh, Group for the Study of Aspirin and Polycythemia Vera uh, indicated that hydroxyurea was not leukemogenic, but those patients were only followed for three years, and we would all agree that it takes at least 10 years for hydroxyurea to begin to show evidence of leukemia. And I think the French have the best study. Uh, they compared uh, hydroxyurea to pipobromine, which for fortunately is not allowed in the United States because it's highly leukemogenic. And in this study, <clears throat> the, uh, it was clear that pipobromine was far more leukemogenic than hydroxyurea. But if you look at the hydroxyurea arm alone, at 10 years, 10% 10 of their patients developed acute leukemia. And by 15 years, 15% 15 did. And this is consistent with the other reports in the literature. Now, the argument that is given is that this is part of the consequences of the natural history of the disease. In my large experience with interferon, in our experience at Cornell, we never see that high incidence of acute leukemia developing in our patients. And I do believe that over the long term, hydroxyurea is leukemogenic. Now, this is very important because if you have a 70-year-old or 80-year-old person who has a high platelet count or has symptomatic phlebotomy-dependent PV and doesn't want injections and you don't want to run the risk of a peripheral neuropathy, then hydroxyurea would be a wonderful choice. But if you have a young pop person with PV and 40% of our patients are under 50, and it's a child-bearing patient, I mean a, a, a woman who wishes to have children, then we would never want to use hydroxyurea in that individual over the long term. Well, very helpful perspective. Now, in November or December of 2014, ruxolitinib was approved in polycythemia vera as second line. And Serge, you really helped to lead the, the global program of the development of that agent, first in MF and also in PV. Why don't you walk us through what are the benefits we've seen with ruxolitinib in PVERA and how that kind of positions itself as second-line therapy for PV? Now, you remember that uh, ruxolitinib was the uh, first agent approved for myelofibrosis ever about three and a half years ago. And that was based on uh, improvement in the symptoms and uh, spleen. The side effect of that therapy that we know all about is myelosuppression requiring those adjustments. Now, if you transfer that experience in polycythemia vera, then you would again have an improvement in the spleen size. You may have improvement in the symptoms. And now that toxicity that is in myelofibrosis, myelosuppression, is now called efficacy. So the drug actually does decrease the numbers, which is needed in PV. It does improve the symptoms and does improve the spleen size. Now, it was tested in a setting where patients that were resistant, refractory, or intolerant to hydroxyurea by certain definitions. And remember, that is very tricky one, actually, to uh, come up with, because so far we never ever had a, a drug approved officially as a therapy for PV. So the experts in the field came together, like we are here today, and uh, said what would constitute a resistant, refractory, or intolerance. Intolerance is really relatively easy, but the other ones are not that easy, and that was implemented by regulatory bodies into the study. This is how we define that group of patients. They needed to have phlebotomy requirement and uh, enlarged spleen. That was the design of the study. The patients were randomized then over 32 weeks to receive ruxolitinib or whatever the doctor wanted to do, including giving patients still hydroxyurea, which about 60% of people did. The interferon was an option, and there were some other medications that were given. In this randomized study, looking at 32-week analysis when everybody was treated for that period of time, there was significant difference in phlebotomy-free percent of patients, so control of the hematocrit. Decrease in the spleen was significantly different between the two arms. 
And the other benefits were normalization of the white cells and platelet and the symptoms. That led to approval of ruxolitinib as a second line therapy after hydroxyurea specifically for patients with polycythemia vera. Certainly that is first time ever again, I think needs to be emphasized in PV. There are issues that we would probably design a little bit different in a different way if we are to repeat the study again. And the role of interferon needs to be uh, obviously highlighted in the armamentarium for PV. But I think that we do have now a valuable medication for a group of patients that suffer from toxicities or intolerance to hydroxyurea. And it's valuable for uh, those patients to use. That's very helpful. It, 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 Emily, as we're monitoring now our patients with P. vera who are on ruxolitinib, and we've monitored many more with myelofibrosis, give folks a sense of how frequently should we be checking blood counts on them? How else are we kind of monitoring them for toxicities? Well, initially we're checking blood counts more frequently, um, probably about every couple weeks. Um, some of these patients are going to be on hydrea still, so we're going to eventually taper them off, or that's the goal. Um, so we're checking blood counts more frequently. Um, the dose may need to be increased, whereas the patients with myelofibrosis, we were often decreasing the dose. And then symptoms are very important too, because um, hopefully the, the Jacify is helping control some of their symptoms as well. Serge, perhaps the, I'll leave you with the final comment. What do you think with our current uh, lines of therapy, uh, are there unmet needs? Have the, are unmet needs in PVRA shrunk? I think they are uh, less evident at this point in time. Um, we talked about the efficacy of hydroxyurea. It's pretty effective, maybe in 66 to 75 percent of the patients, two-thirds, three-quarters of the patients derived satisfactory to a good benefit. But there was a, a niche for developing on another drug, like you pointed out, that uh, group did exist. And now for the second line, uh, ruxolitinib, the JAK inhibitor, is approved. Interferon is an alternative first-line option, second-line option, no doubt about it. With these three medications, I think we cover a lot of patients. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see another group that obviously is in need of something else. We can use radioactive phosphorus or some other agents in very old patients. I don't usually prescribe them at all in a younger folks because of leukemogenic potential. So I think we, I am satisfied. Certainly we would like to do even better, but I'm very happy that we have devised uh, the list of medications that can cover almost everybody. Ruben, if I, may I make a suggestion that we consider uh, the use of uh, interferon together with uh, ruxolitinib in patients who have a lot of systemic symptoms because it's an anti-cytokine effect, and probably the interferon would have a very good uh, uh, therapeutic effect uh, in combination. It, it would make it a little bit more difficult. It really requires an experienced hematologist to use that, but there are now uh, people in Europe, uh, again, in the forefront of using this combination in several trials. And we have used it uh, successfully in patients with high phlebotomy rates, uh, in particularly in younger individuals, and the relief of pruritus and increased well-being and the symptom improvement, which you've always emphasized, has been remarkable with the combination. Would you want to comment on that, or Serge? Well, per 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 perhaps it, 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 just to Emily? close up this session, I think that that's an important perspective. I think it's, it's an important research question. Uh, I think it does still remain a research question, however. I, you know, having used all of these agents, they're very good agents, but you know, there can be subtle but rare toxicities, including issues around immunosuppression, although rare, uh, with ruxolinib and certainly even more common with interferon. Mm -hmm. I do wonder whether by, by impacting the immune system in a couple different arenas, you know, there may be long-term unexpected consequences. So I think, it's, I think it's an important research question, but I think it probably remains, at least, at least in my eyes, probably a research question. Well, great discussion. Really appreciate all of your perspectives as we focused on the current therapy of polycythemia vera. Thank you.